Well, thank you, Sue. That's very kind of you. It's extremely kind of you to invite me here today. Although I'm, un I'm here under false pretenses, as I'll explain in a moment. But it's uh, this place was very close to my heart for many years in, uh, in my work at the Institute. And indeed, I think the last time I walked into this place, in particularly this building itself, must be 13, 14 years ago. And things have changed. I was quite intrigued to see the interior reconstruction <laughs> in this building. And I very much approve. Um, I'm here under false pretenses because I don't have a crystal ball. I don't think anyone ever does. And I think predictions don't work. So um, I'm not in the business of uh, giving predictions. One can give a little bit of comment on the way things might be moving at the present time to see if collectively we can shift things around a bit. But that's about as much as, it, uh, as I think we can do. We are in the hands of politicians. And one of the things we have to do is to remember that and to try to interact politically with uh, uh, our paymasters. Um, but that is difficult, particularly at the present time when there's, a, uh, you know, there's austerity programs and so on. But I am worried uh, very much about one particular trend, and I'll mention that first. This was a, a comment that was made in 1995 by Fuller Torrey, who is a, a, a psychiatrist in the US. Quietly but steadily, jails and prisons are replacing public mental hospitals as the primary purveyors of public psychiatric services for individuals with serious mental illness in the US. Now, if you worked in uh, this kind of world I worked in before I retired, where you only deal with really uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with hospital work and medium secure units and other such things, and I had outpatients and community care and that kind of thing, uh, you might think, well, that would never apply to us. But um, I was collaborated with a, with a study that was done by the um, Sainsbury Trust uh, before it lost its Sainsbury name. Um, and uh, what was obvious was that a, a trend called convergence, which is a nice name. Euphemisms always emerge from when things are happening badly, I think. Convergence was occurring. And I think you could change that slide now to the following. In other words, replace the United States with the United Kingdom. And I know this particularly because of the, the figures that came out of that study by the Sainsbury uh, Trust, but also because of my work, as Susie mentioned now, on the parole board, where day after day, and I know I'm selected to do that sort of stuff, but day after day I see very serious mental disorders of all kinds in the prisons, and the prison staff have no hope of getting these people into proper health care and in reach which I spent a lot of time championing in my earlier days, really doesn't work. And that's very depressing. But it's perhaps not surprising, considering that prisons are not really built and equipped to be healthcare centers. Just let me remind you of how all this came about. In the 19th century, um, it was decided that some people shouldn't be hanged and that some people shouldn't be uh, let loose if they are very mad. They should be just locked up. James Hadfield was the obvious beginner of all this in 1800. But gradually, a, a system of locking people up for their mental disorders occurred. And interesting enough, in this country, it wasn't just for people who were non-offenders, it was also for offenders. And James Hadfield was the, the example. And it's very interesting, too, to realize that James Hadfield's life was partly spared by the king, who himself had a lot of mental health problems. Um, when Hadfield attacked him, he said, look after that man, he's ill, which is quite an interesting uh, beginning because following that, Hadfield was found not guilty by reason of insanity and then at that, moment, at that time he would be released. But the Criminal Lunatics Act was brought in exactly the same time to stop him being released and, and we're off. And of course this hospital grows out of the Bethlehem wing, special wing which was built for Hadfield. And I understand, and Kevin was just filling me in, you're celebrating your 150th anniversary this year, which is quite intriguing. 
Now, I'm an advocate of special hospitals, and I have been for many years, even though I never worked in one clinically. I worked here for quite some time uh, in uh, uh, res res quasi research capacity. I'll come to that. But um, special hospitals started in 1850 at Dundrum, actually. 1863 was this one, and then the others followed, and we ended up with Broadmoor, Rampton, Ashworth in England, and of course Castares in Scotland, and I don't know the dates, so I haven't put that on the list. But 1948. Sorry? 1948. 1948, so it comes a bit later than the, the other ones. <laughs> um, and I think that this, I, you notice I use the name special hospitals. I'm always in trouble, particularly at home, for using that term, because I decline from using the name high security hospitals for several reasons. Certainly they do provide high security, but they also provide a lot of other things which are very special. And I think we should hang on to that because I, I think to lose special hospitals, as some people have advocated for all my career, would be a great tragedy. They are really very important. What do they offer? Well, they offer special security, special long-term care, I hope that they will continue to offer and have offered research, including research other than medical research, psychology obviously, but nursing research, occupational research. They offer training, education, sports we've heard about, recreation, which is very important for, particularly for long-term patients and occupations and so on, which this hospital is quite well known for. And all these things are different from what can be offered in other places. If you see what happens in a medium secure unit, they struggle to offer many, any, many of these things and they're blocked up with people on a long term basis. So there needs to be a focus on special hospitals and to take some of the heat off medium security units. That doesn't mean they should be got changed or downgraded in any way, but they, they should be uh, a, a change of emphasis to make these places the center of the kind of things I've just been saying, in my view. There was an old picture of Rome. I thought you'd like that one, which was, comes from 1867. There's a that Joshua Jebb's fine building right up on the hill there. You can still see it. It's just really the same in many ways. And that's a more modern one, which I managed to get without that wretched link fence, fence in. Uh, which has uh, distressed me no end. Um, I can tell you the year it was introduced, it was awful. I was in the States when I heard the report come out and I knew that stigma was going to increase. Are the old consultant's hut still there? Yes. Yeah. Patients education. Recovery. They used for what? Recovery. Patient recovery. But recovery of consultants <laughs> or, recovery <laughs> or recovery of other people, right. I mention other landmarks because I think we have to integrate our thinking in forensic psychiatry with the rest of psychiatry. 1923 was a landmark for other reasons, and that was because of the building of the hospital that I worked in for most of my life. And the deed which Henry Maudsley, who was a forensic psychiatrist, gave to the hospital, or to the LCC, to, to build a hospital which didn't have any uh, compulsion at all, and where patients were meant to be on a par with all general patients. And in fact, that set the trend for the Mental Treatment Act, which came in 1930. I haven't got time to go into all this, of course, and you, you know it anyway. Uh, and the, the later 1959 Mental Health Act. But none of that really brought about, although we've got the special hospitals to build before all this, none of that really brought about forensic psychiatry in its modern way. And I've highlighted in green that the event that brought about um, the uh, development of forensic psychiatry as such, I refer to it as the Butler Report, and you'll see it's not Butler that I'm showing a picture of, it's for me one of the key man in the development of, of British forensic psychiatry, which was Dennis Hill. He was on the Butler Report, and I, it would take me a long time to explain the, the number of things he did to help this specialty. But one of the, some of the, uh, of the proposals that I'll give you, obviously the regional secure units which came about, he wanted to integrate the prison medical service with the NHS, and that was a long fight, and we've done it, and it hasn't actually changed anything very much. Uh, early transfer of mentally disordered prisoners to the hospital. Well, as I've said, I think that's getting worse, not better. 
voluntary treatment for psychopaths, whatever they are, I don't use that term but personally, but they used it in the Butler report, and I, I really don't know what they meant. I suspect they meant things like therapeutic communities for people with personality disorder, but uh, it's a very strange phrase, that one. Proper aftercare for offender patients, and that's a key to getting throughput in through the whole system. If we don't have decent outpatient and, and aftercare services, we're not, the system will almost always clog up. Preventive arrest by police and short-term admission. I put that up there because I was staggered to find it recently. Um, it's not something I'd ever thought. I'd, for, I'd forgotten about it completely. And I suspect that's the origin of, of the DSPD uh, debacle, which I would wax on for many hours if you wanted me to. I do talk too much, so you have to shut me up. But I don't know where, what they meant by that. But medical remands to hospital. We went into the uh, recent acts. Um, they don't happen very much. And that's one of the problems. Attitudes in psychiatry, also, not only politicians, but attitudes in psychiatry also change things. And the courts are very willing to do these kind of things, but they don't happen because hospitals and psychiatrists don't want them. Right, well, that was the Butler Report and all its recommendations. I haven't emphasized the one thing that's in the report, because it's not identified as a recommendation, but if you read the report carefully, it was also arguing that forensic psychiatry, like any other branch of medicine, should be an academic specialty. You cannot really have a specialty which doesn't have an academic base. Science is crucial to modern medicine, and that's no less true of forensic psychiatry than any other specialty. There was a response to that immediately, the development of the uh, Special Hospital Research Unit, which the headquarters were here, and it was, had branches in the other special hospitals in England. And um, we struggled. We had a budget, and that budget disappeared eventually. And I, again, it's, it's, I haven't got time to develop all these points, but it was a real struggle. But the Special Hospital Service Authority was set up in 1990, and that changed things quite radically really and following that the money that we would had for Shrew was devoted to an academic department here um, which uh, brought about the, the first professor of special hospital psychiatry, in fact the only professor of special hospital psychiatry that I know of um, and uh, she of course has left and she now works in uh, Cardiff um, and then came the dreaded tilt report and at that time I was very active in the forensic uh, faculty and I remember having terrible rows with Richard Tilt, he was a terribly nice man really, but he had no idea about hospitals and what, to, and what security in a hospital means or how to run it. And in fact, one of our big problems in forensic psychiatry is stigma, and that added to stigma, and it's added to costs in the hospital, and I don't think it's made one improvement, therapeutic improvement, or public safety improvement that one can think of. But the shrew, and then later the um, the professorial department of, of special hospital psychiatry, of course, was in the Richard Dad unit, and I understand Susie is now ensconced in, in that very building. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> Which is great. I'm delighted. I didn't know that, and I'm absolutely delighted that things are going on in a way which I feared might not happen. I haven't been able to extrapolate this, extrapolate this because those figures were done for me by, by somebody else in 2006. But you can see what's happening in forensic psychiatry, that the referrals to this specialty are going up and up and up. And in fact, expansion is occurring, but not at a rate that will absorb that kind of ri uh, rate of increase. And I want to emphasize something that's neglected because <clears throat> one of the other origins of forensic psychiatry has always been psychotherapy. And that started in the prisons. Hamlin Smith had a special clinic in, the, in Birmingham prison in, in, uh, just after the First World War. And uh, Grendon developed out of the ideas that psychotherapy work. And we were able to show, I was able to show in a study uh, in the 70s that it does work, that people do get better in psychotherapeutic environments. It's hardly surprising. Talking treatments are 
the bedrock, really, of psychiatry. Even if you think of the things that Jeremy was talking about earlier on, if you give just, just, just give pills to people, well, you get some re improvements. But if you actually give them psychotherapy as well and deal with other aspects of their mental state which are uh, not necessarily responding in the same way, you get improvements. So psychotherapy is an absolute bedrock of uh, forensic psychiatry, and I think it's in decline, and I'm very worried about that. So what do I think is required for the future? Well, I think we need an increase in special hospital beds, and that's, that's uh, counterintuitive uh, to most people. It's all the people are talking about knocking down Broadmoor and building a hotel, <coughs> and so on. It's always been talked about in my time. We need more forensic beds in open conditions. We need more secure beds, but especially, again, in the special hospitals for long stay, we need more hostels, specialized hostels, therapeutic communities, medical psychotherapy, which I've just emphasized, and we need sex offender units. This country really doesn't do much for sex offenders. It's very poor, and the public actually wants us to. The model that we're using is this one, which uh, understandable, it came out of the Butler report really, and uh, um, I can see the point of it, and if you go to somewhere like the John Howard Pavilion, you will see, well that's ideal, it's great. But I think that although I'm not against that model, I think there's another way of looking at the development of forensic psychiatry, and that's to switch things around slightly and put special hospitals at the centre and with all the kind of things that I was mentioning on mentioning just now. Academic forensic psychiatry, uh, very briefly, because time's running out, is in decline. And that's a great pity because it seems to have peaked. Uh, the section of Forensic Psychiatry Institute was started in 1946 by Aubrey Lewis, a very far-sighted gentleman. And we had, an, first of all, Trevor Gibbons got a personal chair, then there was the established chair in 78, and then we became an independent department, uh, separated off from general psychiatry in 1988. And then, of course, there were a number of other chairs funded around the country, of which Jeremy is a holder at uh, Queen Mary. And uh, following 2002, when I left, the independent department, which I had struggled so hard to develop, was retrieved. They didn't like that. So they had to go straight back into another department, and it went back in, in with mental handicap. And the, the approach to forensic psychiatry has reverted to what it was in 1975-6, when I was beginning to try to set up a, a medium secure service for the southeast region. And I'm afraid that academic developments are such that if you look around for candidates to fill these chairs as they become, as people retire, you'll find there are very few candidates indeed. And that's a terrible indictment on what we've been doing. And I feel partly responsible for that, I think. So as a penalty for all that, I've set up a charity and it's just, just, just started. It's having its second or third meeting a couple of weeks' time. And I'll leave you a few leaflets about that on the table here. The charity's aim is to do what, for this specialty, what is done for almost every medical specialty, and that is collect money which is earmarked for the specialty. You cannot imagine the advances in cancer uh, or the treatment of cancer or heart troubles and so on without those big charities. But every small specialty, too, in medicine has its own earmarked uh, charity. Think of diabetes or whatever you like. And so we've set up this charity, which is just taking its first faltering steps and I hope will grow into a charity which will provide the likes of the hospital here and the, all of you who are doing this research with a backbone of funds, financial funds, for the future. So I want to get rid of this idea of convergence. I want it to fall over and I want clinically a change of direction also. I, as I say, I haven't got enough time in a short talk to uh, develop these points. But one of the things I think that is so difficult in forensic psychiatry is we're stuck on the old diagnoses and the notion that 
enduring mental illness is what we're about. Well, it is in part, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be, but if you think of what the, uh, the man on the Clapham Omnibus expects of psychiatry, it's a lot of other things too. And this model comes from the other side of the world. It comes from Melbourne. And there's a there was a clinic set up there by my good friend and colleague, Paul Mullen. And it took a behavioral approach to psychiatry and started to take referrals. And it's very easy to get them. If you start, if you advertise that you're interested in stalkers, for example, you'll find that GPs, psychiatrists, and so on will rapidly uh, refer them. And of course, these people are dangerous and they're difficult. And, in, and if you see them in prison, whatever, the prison doctor says, oh, it's got no mental illness, nothing to do with us. But these are serious mental health problems. And Paul developed all those uh, facilities, except I think car theft, which I've added at the bottom, because I did have a clinic myself at one time for car thieves. Um, but and shoplifting. And shop, you're right, and shoplifting. Yes, we did do that. And I, think, I don't think Paul does that either. I think, I think you're right. We had both of those, haven't we? <laughs> um, and they do produce an immense amount of pathology, and they, are produce, they produce a lot of patients that are eminently treatable, particularly with psychotherapy, but also with everything else. So I want that model uh, as a new clinical model. And I want to, I, yes, I've left one out because I've, I've been very conscious of time, but I just wanted to say what the problems are for the future of forensic psychiatry, which we ought to focus on. Money I've mentioned, but recruitment is a major difficulty. And that goes with funds, but it also goes with the other problem, which is stigma. People don't want to work in forensic psychiatry because they're a bit scared of stigma. And they are scared of coming here, for example, because of stigmatization. And we have somehow or other to get over that particular problem. And the other thing we need to do is to, to talk of education in a broader sense. Because and that's what I'm, one of the things I hope the funding of the charity will do, which is not just training of psychiatrists or psychologists, which is very, very important, but also education nurses, the public, and so on, so that they think in terms of prevention and of a different way of doing things from the standard kind of uh, knee-jerk reaction of lock him up and throw the key away whenever a serious crime is committed. But I think I've run out of time, so I should leave it there and be very willing to talk to people if they wish.